Coming up on DTNS, do you need to worry about the log jam vulnerability that's tearing up the internet, Minecraft and beyond? Well, Shannon Morse is going to tell us. Plus, Microsoft really tried to have cloud gaming in the iOS app store. It really tried. And there's a clever offline solution to EV charging. <laughs> This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, December 10th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Studio Colorado, I'm Shannon Morse. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. There is a long version of this show where we range into other topics and talk about West Side Story and all kinds of cool stuff. If you want that show, it's called Good Day Internet, available at patreon.com slash DTNS. And speaking of Patreon, big thanks to our top patrons. Today, they include Philip Shane, Paul Boyer, and Brad. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Google will bring the Play Games app to Windows PCs in 2022, letting Windows 10 and 11 users play Android games. Players will be able to resume games on a PC after starting to play them on an Android device or a Chromebook. Games will run locally. Google developed this as a native Windows app and doesn't use the Windows subsystem for Android. Xbox Game Pass for PC is no more. It's just changed its name. It's now called PC Game Pass. Still uses the Xbox logo, otherwise the service is the same, and the combined Xbox and PC service is still called Xbox Game Pass Ultimate. Facebook announced two new tests for live chat support features for English-speaking users. One provides live chat support for creators who don't have an assigned relationship manager for things like questions on new features and payouts. The other provides chat help for those who've been locked out of their accounts. Apparently, there are quite a few of you. Oh, Canada, you are not left out of the 15-minute grocery delivery trend. Vancouver-based Tiggy announced it has funding to get more dark stores up and running in Vancouver and expand into Toronto. Tiggy offers fast delivery with no minimum charge or extra fees. That's a cute name, Tiggy. Tiggy. The information sources say that Meta Platforms, you know, the parent company of Facebook, has reorged its artificial intelligence group into the Reality Labs unit, which develops AR and VR products. The AI team, which works to detect harmful content on Facebook or has, you know, pretty pretty much up until now, will now focus its work on metaverse-related projects. Meta platforms, that's my dad. Call me Facebook. Uh, all right, <laughs> let's talk a little more about this Microsoft thing. Uh, Sean Hollister over at The Verge, happens to be my brother-in-law, did a great job uh, digging into the emails of Epic and Apple and getting some comments from Microsoft. Apple, as you may know, does not allow alternate app stores and so does not allow game apps to offer multiple games. Each game has to be a separate app even if it's streaming. There's other reasons beside the app store, but the upshot is you can't have a game store, even if the games are at no additional cost. Emails disclosed as part of the Epic versus Apple trial show that in March 2020, Microsoft proposed creating individual apps for Apple's app store to every game it wanted to stream as part of the Microsoft Cloud Gaming streaming service called Project X Cloud at the time. And they even tried to sweeten the deal by mentioning some AAA Xbox exclusive games might be made available on iOS and nowhere else. Be the Xbox and iOS be the only place you can play them. The only thing Microsoft wanted to do was make the game apps smaller by using the streaming engine in the main Xbox cloud gaming app. So the cloud gaming app you'd download, that would have the streaming engine. And then each game you would download would use that app to do the streaming. You'd still have to download the games app, but you wouldn't have to replicate the whole streaming engine in every copy of every game. That would reduce the game apps from 150 megabytes to 30 megabytes, and that would mean that each game would not need a separate update every time you needed to update the streaming engine. Microsoft told The Verge that Apple rejected those proposals as it required every game to include the full streaming stack. Now, Apple says that they denied the proposal because Microsoft didn't want to integrate Apple's in-app payment process for in-game purchases. Uh, so, you know, for things like in Halo, uh, you, you get in-game items. Uh, Microsoft was like, yeah, that, that, that seems like a lot of work. Uh, we don't want to do a large amount of redundant API work. We'll still, we're, we'll still pay you somehow. We just don't want to have to redo that. Microsoft says, no, it wasn't the payment stuff, uh, pointing out that it offers Xbox Cloud Gaming and Google's Play Store without Google Pay integrated. 
Uh, and that's fine. Of course, Google allows all kinds of things that Apple doesn't. Microsoft makes Xbox Cloud Gaming available on iOS through a web app now. If you're like, wait a minute, I thought they were there. They are there. You just have to get it through Safari. But I don't, I don't know about y'all, uh, Shannon, Sarah, but uh, to me, this this just feels like it. it's not about greed in this instance because this doesn't help Apple make more money to, to be such a stickler about this. This is just Apple saying, I'm sorry, we have rules and we blindly follow them, whether they make sense or not. <laughs> yeah, Apple is sounding a little stingy here. It's And it to me, it doesn't make that much sense as a user because it's frustrating to see Apple make these decisions when I know if they you know, had a little bit of leeway and allowed Microsoft to do this, then it would be s so much better for a user experience. It's disappointing. I think, I don't know. I mean, the way that I see this is, you know, it's a little bit of like, ooh, you know, we're a fly on the wall of whatever corporate meetings, you know, where uh, Microsoft said, look, Apple, we're offering you something pretty great for you. And Apple saying, nope, nope, nope. Same rules for everybody. And I think when you're Apple, especially in Apple's uh, current legal climate, if you were to allow Microsoft to have a bit of a sweetheart deal where Microsoft gets, gets what it wants and Apple gets some exclusive Xbox games that you couldn't play you know, in, in a mobile way otherwise, that sounds great. But Apple knows that that opens the floodgates to all sorts of other companies to say, well, if you did that for Microsoft, it's kind of how you know Apple and Amazon were accused of having sweetheart deals in the not too distant uh, past. Uh, same thing where Apple has to kind of stick to its guns, even if it means it loses out on something pretty cool. I, I just I look at this and I'm like, I get the chain of logic of like, well, we don't allow this. And so if we allow this, then someone will say, well, I'm just doing what Google is doing with Stadia, even though they're not. And they'll try to get around the rules, except they already make exceptions. They make exceptions for uh, Amazon, Kindle. You have reader apps. They said, OK, we'll make an exception. We'll allow you to access services. Remember the whole thing with the email service? We're like, well, you're not a reader app, so we're not going to allow you. Yeah. Make an exception. You're always going to have lines when you're making rules. Make an exception for streaming game services. They're brand new. You didn't contemplate these when you made your original App Store rules. I don't know why they're being so intractable about that. Well, it's Apple, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, that, all that right. Well, here, here, here's some good news. If you happen to have an EV vehicle or thinking about getting one, the next web's Kate Lawrence has an interesting write-up on the EV charging system that works without internet connectivity. If you are an EV car user or just a user of anything mobile, you might notice that parking garages never really have good connectivity. Remote locations sometimes don't have any. A company called Zeal, that's X-E-A-L, created the system using NFC and a distributed ledger running on a blockchain. They call it the no internet for things. Get it? Because it's a thing, but it doesn't need internet. Here's how it works. First, you need a phone with NFC. So. Some of you, uh, many of you are, are already still in the game here. When you have an internet connection, when you have that, that connection, you need to install the app and connect account, connect a payment method, et cetera, all the usual things. Then when you park your EV and plug it into charge, you don't actually need that connection because you've already set it up. You tap your phone's NFC against the charger, you start charging. A time-bound cryptographic token is provided when you were connected to the internet back when you first connected, and that will identify you to the charger because you're already in the system. When you finish charging, you tap again, and you're done. The next time you're connected to the internet, the app will update everything, and your payment is processed. You might be thinking, though, well, hold on a second. Why would I need a blockchain, and couldn't I just not connect to the internet again and get free charging? If you're not connected to the internet, how is it ever going to process your payment? The first is the answer to the second. When you connect to the charging station by NFC, you're not only exchanging your cryptographic token, but you're also updating the charging station's blockchain to your app. So the next time you're connected to the internet, that update is passed along. You could delete the app, I guess, and try to avoid syncing your charge. However, think of this as the blockchain. The next person to use that station might not. So your transaction is going to get uploaded when they connect to the internet because it's all interlinked. The system also has the added benefit of being unavailable for remote attacks and the distributed ledger is resistant to attacks on the database itself. 
pretty genius. It's so cool. I'm really excited about this. Not because I have a electronic vehicle, an EV, and I can't really use it personally quite yet, but just the fact that they were able to put together NSC, near field communication, which in the security sense, it does require, you know, an attacker would be need to be somewhere in that like line of sight in that locale in order to be able to attack it over NFC, but also just the fact that they were able to figure out how to do this is very, very futuristic in a sense. I mean, I, and, I, I, go ahead, Shannon. Sorry. Uh, and I do wonder like how they would be able to implement this in other ways for people that don't necessarily have EVs. Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's, that's a great question, right? Cause I think the most genius part of this is someone saying, well, hold on a second. Maybe I can circumvent pain altogether. And it's like, Mm-hmm. No, you've you you're part of the record. You're on the ledger. So. Yeah, that's the the beauty if you understand the distributed ledger and how blockchains work is one of the reasons they are so robust is there are thousands of copies of the blockchain. So even if yeah. you are successful at changing one of the copies, you'll get outvoted because there's all these other copies out there going, nope, nope, that transaction belongs to that. And so you can't get away without paying because then I guess if it's a re- really remote location that only has like one person charging every couple of months, you might be able to get away with something once, but that's hardly worth it at that point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so this, this really does uh, propose a, a, a way to do reliable connectivity offline. And the company is also looking at other ways to, to use this like smart door locks, you know, for access Ooh. control, things like yeah. that, where, Again, the lock would not have to connect to a network and therefore would be resistant to hacking. I mean, I think about things like this working in the future for something like my, um, uh, what is it called? Uh, the easy pass or whatever I use to go across yes. uh, the bridges in the Bay Area. Um, you know, that all, you know, is, is part of a, a, you know, a physical thing that I have in my car. If for whatever reason that physical thing isn't, uh, isn't noted when I go through, my license plate is scanned and I get a bill eventually. You know what I mean? Like it will catch up with me. This just seems like a much uh, more streamlined way to do the same thing. Yeah. I'm trying now. Now you got me thinking of like, what are the blockchain advantages for fast pass for, for that, yes, for, for toll systems, that kind of stuff. Public Easy transport. Pass. <laughs> I, don't know. It's been I think there is I've one out East called Easy Pass. Payment. Actually. Okay. Yeah. yeah. There is, and fast pass, and there's all the passes. Anyway, <laughs> we have some more exciting news. Um, smart home company Eve is known for having an Apple-like design and Apple HomeKit compatibility, which is great for you Apple users, not so much for me, but it will be soon, which I'm very excited about. Apple stores carry their products. They make home security products like motion sensors, cameras, smart pl- plugs, light switches, power meters, air quality monitors, so much more. Most recently, smart blinds. So cool. Eve was also one of the first device device makers to release Thread-based products. Now, Thread is a standard being widely adopted to replace older tech like Z-Wave and Zigbee. It needs a router that supports it, such as an Eero or most smart assistants. Thread goes hand-in-hand with the Matter protocol for interoperability. About half of Eve's products support Thread now, and the company is launching Thread-enabled versions of its water sensor in February its portable lamp in March, and its hardwired wall switch and motion sensor shortly thereafter. Now, all of this is in preparation to support Matter when the standard officially launches in June. Matter support will start with the Eve Energy Smart Plug, Eve Motion and Door and Window Sensors in June, with everything but the cameras supporting Matter by the end of the year. Eve cameras use Wi-Fi not Thread, which will work with Matter, but cameras are not a part of the Matter protocol at launch. Now the upshot is, this is my favorite part, all of that Eve product and devices, all of those different devices, they will be able to keep their promise of not using the cloud to manage your devices, but they can extend that compatibility to Google, Samsung, and Amazon devices. So I'm looking forward to the day that I will be able to use Eve products with Android devices. Yeah, the the Eve stuff is not only uh, nicely designed. Uh, people people tend to admire its its design, but it is also committed to being off the grid. They they don't want to use a cloud service. They protect privacy. This is all local, which is why they use HomeKit only because it's very difficult to implement a lot of these other protocols without somehow getting on the internet. Uh, and Matter will make it 
and, and thread uh, so that they can support more platforms without ever having to compromise on that, without ever sending a bit out outside of your home network. They'll just use thread to control things, which makes me want to get an Eve camera because then I know mm -hmm. it, my, my Microsoft Duo and my iPhone will both be able to control it, uh, no problem, because it's just going to use thread. I, I won't need a hub. Uh, I just need a router that's compatible. I happen to have an Eero router, so I'm already good there. Uh, this This is one of the promises of matter uh, that I think is is going to to really open people's eyes of like, oh, I can stop thinking about all of these things. Like, will this work with that? And I, I think this is great. I think there 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 may be a few people, especially since we had a matter conversation this week about you know why it's good, what companies are are super on board, uh, and and what the limitations might be, you know, for consumer rollouts in the near future. If if someone says, well, okay, I have a thread based product and that works with matter. Wasn't the idea that matter was supposed to be built into the product? Well, yeah, and that's a good that's a really good point. Thread is one of the ways of communicating, and it's built alongside matter to be like, here's the if you don't want to use Wi-Fi, here's a, here's a great protocol that that's matter compliant right out of the box. Zigbee and Z-Wave can still work with matter. There are ways to do that. It's just more complicated on the developer side. Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, they they also can work with matter. Matter is the protocol for once you've sent your signal through the air. Here's how we make sure everybody's speaking the same language. Uh, so, and, and we have an interview with Stacey Higginbotham on Know A Little More if you if you want to go beyond that. But that's kind of the way to think of it. Matter is the platform and mm -hmm. thread is the the transmissions, so to speak. Yeah, makes, makes your smart uh, home devices work nicely with matter. Yeah, and you can do matter without thread. You could actually do thread without matter, but they work nicely together. Nice. Uh, folks, we love to hear what you want us to talk about on the show. I look at it every single day to find out. It's our subreddit. You can go submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Security researchers at Alibaba discovered a huge vulnerability uh, now being called Log4Shell or Logjam in a common Java element. And thank goodness Shannon is here to help us understand it. Uh, here are the basics. Log4j is an open source Java-based logging utility. It's used by a lot of companies. Logging is really important when you're when you're running a server, uh, and Log4j is one that a lot of companies have implemented. However, it reached its end of life and was replaced by an entirely new product. It's not a version number. This is an entirely new type of logging called Log4j2 on August 5th, 2015. However, as we all know, not everybody always upgrades to the new thing, uh, and it stuck around in legacy software. And it's everywhere. Web front ends, network appliances, legacy APIs, and particularly where it was first noticed, Minecraft servers. Those depend on older versions of Java runtimes for mod compatibility. Uh, it's also been identified as being part of Steam and Apple's iCloud servers. It's incorporated into lots of server suites, including several Apache frameworks, which is one of the reasons it's everywhere. Alibaba's security team reported the exploit to Apache on November 24th. It lets attackers run malicious code on the server or client running Java with Log4j. Proof of concept code is out there. It was posted on GitHub Thursday. And CertNZ, CertNZ New Zealand, has warned of exploits in the wild. So this is not just theoretical. Uh, Shannon, let's start with how does this vulnerability work? Like, what what's the action here? Okay, so <laughs> it's a uh, it's kind of complicated, but for for an attacker themselves, it would be uh, relatively simplistic. So when it comes to log4j, that's pretty much in charge of logging, and it's something that a user wouldn't necessarily be paying attention to, and when implemented on an application, it's just collecting this data. And if any codes are thrown at it, any kind of scripts, then it will execute on that code on whatever is returned. So for an attacker, it's really easy to exploit this bug since basically like millions of applications are currently using this, this framework, this technology on their backend to make things easier for themselves. And like practically nobody ever updates their things. So an attacker would simply be able to exploit this uh, with a log message. So one of those examples could be a chat message. They could put a specific script 
a little line of code, something that's malicious, into a chat message or into a text box. Uh, one example I saw on the GitHub page for the proof of concept and some of the examples that I saw showed the Apple login screen for Apple ID and you put this malicious code into the text box for the login page and that mm -hmm. would execute the code from log4j. Uh, so this is relatively scary to look at as a user. Um, and it's not something that a lot of users would necessarily know how to protect against, but it's something that network admins and application developers need to pay attention to. So it sounds like if you uh, if you scan around and find that a vulnerable version of log4j is being run on this Apache server, you can just go onto that server. Let's say it has a Minecraft uh, server running, uh, and you send a message that has a code string in it, uh, yeah. and boom, you're you're in. Is, the, is it go. that easy? Yeah. It's not that hard <laughs> to exploit. It sounds like. Yeah, it's um, it's relatively easy as far as what I have read from a lot of the information security nerds that I follow on Twitter and a lot of my friends. Uh, they've pretty much come to the uh, con conclusive uh, finding that this is a really easy thing to use, and that's why the CVE for this attack has gotten a the maximum score of ten. So it's extremely severe because it's so easy to execute, and an attacker doesn't need to be like in the server room with a server right. for an application, like wherever it's built. It can be remote. It can be completely remote. They just have to figure out like which of these apps is vulnerable, and if they're spraying and praying this attack at whatever they want, it's possible that they could find them relatively easily. All right. So what do companies do uh, I, I, if they're using log4j? Uh, what, what can they do to stop this? So luckily, Apache did release an update, which thank the Lord, I'm glad they did. Um, so mm -hmm. there is another option that you do have is to set this thing called a system property to true. And that's for the log4j um, lookups. So you have to go into your command line, uh, the programming, the scripting for this log4j and change that to true, and then remove this other class lookup, this class called, I think it's JNDI lookup, mm -hmm. which I don't understand completely what that means, but that's what you can do if you're an application developer or somebody that's in charge of the application. So I imagine most of us are just hoping that the, uh, the apps and services we use do that or have already done that. Uh, yeah. Is there anything we can do on our own to defend against this? So I did ask around for some recommendations from my friends who run their own applications. And one recommendation is make sure that whoever is running your Minecraft software or your server, make sure that they are updated and they are aware of this attack and they know how to update. Um, and then hopefully they will be able to manage that. And once that's done, make sure that you are updating your software and be very aware of whatever servers you are entering into make sure that you're not going into any unknown servers and check the open source software as well to see which version of log4j uh, your specific server is using. Um, yeah. Another option you can do, and this was also recommended to me by an expert in the field, is sometimes as a user, and it's, this is mostly for prosumers, you can look at the shell script or a batch file for the software that you are running. And oftentimes you can see the same argument uh, about changing the, the lookups to true uh, okay. that I had mentioned previously. So you can sometimes change that on your application's end, uh, the user end. So that's a potential that you could do, but it's not necessarily something I would recommend to every user. So the the biggest the biggest takeaway here is sysadmins, please patch patch patch. You're a patch patch yes. patchies. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not necessarily something that users would need to. Well, you got to worry about it, but it's not something that's easily fixable on the user end. So network admins, uh, developers, please update. Well, as we march toward the end of 2021, lots of companies have year in reviews of sorts, depending on the platform. Twitter is no exception. The company released its 2021 rankings. Some of these are US based specifically, some of them are global, but it includes things that were tweeted about the most. So in the US, the most tweeted about streaming show of the year, drum roll please, Squid Game, not a huge surprise. Yeah. WandaVision and Loki 
all both on Disney Plus. We're at number two and three. Fourth place was iCarly on Paramount Plus, and Ted Lasso at number five on Apple TV Plus. Now, as far as all US TV, not just streaming, but just TV in general, you get classics like Sesame Street, SNL, Game of Thrones. Well, not, not so much a classic anymore. Uh, Jeopardy, Grey's Anatomy. Those made the top ten. That's what uh, what Twitter I- I includes. Just television, not necessarily something that you streamed. In reality TV, The Bachelor saw the most tweets, followed mm-hmm. by RuPaul's Drag Race, uh, The Voice, American Idol, and The Real Housewives of Atlanta, a personal favorite of mine. Due to overall popularity, Twitter gave Korean entertainment its own category for the first time. Although K-pop group BTS was the top tweeted about music group globally mm-hmm. and fourth in the U.S., that's not in any category. That's just a fact. <laughs> Taylor Swift was the top tweeted about female musician in the U.S. She was also number two globally behind BTS. The most Our liked tweet. Collab. Yeah. <laughs> the most liked tweet in the U.S. from a celebrity came from Olympian Simone Biles. She made a lot of news at the Tokyo Olympics over the summer. And Manchester United was the most talked about sports team worldwide. As for tweets that were quoted, and yes, Twitter does break that out into a separate category as well. The top tweet came from Nick Jr. celebrating Blue's Clues 25th anniversary. Well, that uh, fits with my 2021. Uh, This is this is always fascinating stuff. We'll have a link to the to the main Twitter blog if you want to dig into this uh, and stuff. But I, I don't think anything really shocked me in there that all maybe Game of Thrones still being up there like you said would be the closest yeah. to surprise though. classic yeah. television yeah well it Although, is cla- at this point i guess it's fading into i guess classic. yeah it's so yeah, yeah. It's, yeah but people it's... are still tweeting about it too i think that surprises me even more yeah totally all right let's check out the mailbag oh we got a good one from martin martin wrote in with reasons that he thinks that snap uh you know maker of snapchat and others is the stalking horse of the next platform. Martin says, I have a small amount of Snap stock, so, you know, there is that. But here are Martin's reasons that he thinks Snap is doing the right thing. Number one, Snapchat was really the first company to make the iPhone and underpowered Androids do pretty good AR almost a year before both Apple and Google were able to crack that egg on commercial products. Since then, Martin says, their filters tend to be the highest quality and they go viral. The anime face, if you're, you know, switching genders on a photo, that kind of thing. They're also doing this on iOS and Android at the same time. Second note, Martin says, they own Bitmoji, which is still pretty much the only one in the market for digital avatars that people use in other platforms. They've integrated into the Google keyboard. Plus, one of the hardest things is that they've managed to make your 2D custom avatar come to life in 3D. That doesn't look creepy. It's kind of fun. The third note Martin has is their developer outreach for use as a communication platform unparalleled. This is Twitter's new strategy, but Twitter is the problem that now the senior developers and engineer managers that were burned by Twitter are just getting started. So Martin says, I'm sure they'll be the last to put any effort on a product that relies on Twitter. Yeah. After years of Twitter burning developers, I I don't think the developers are going to jump into Twitter as enthusiastically as they might. I don't blame uh, them. Into a snap thing. That's great. That is good. The good analysis, Martin. Thank you for this. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Also, if you have feedback like Martin does, um, sometimes people send us audio messages and boy, we can't always uh, roll them in the show, but we love those too. I mean, you are a smart bunch of folks. Please do send all your feedback our way. It makes for fun weekend reading. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We also have a couple of brand new bosses, three to be exact. Bert McCrutchen, Davy Chan, and Stan Grip. All just started backing us on Patreon. We've really been on a roll this week. We are feeling the holiday. Love everybody. Thanks, Bert. Thanks, Davy, And thanks, Stan. Ah, yeah, you guys, you're the best. Keep it coming, uh, y'all. We want, we want to see who's new. We want to see more new names tomorrow. Could be you. You might be there tomorrow. All right. Thanks to uh, Len Peralta, who has been illustrating uh, busily like a like a little uh, Santa's elf uh, this entire show. Len, what have you drawn for us? Well, this is another reason why you should support Daily Tech News Show is because I can almost guarantee you that this is the only cartoon out there about log for j Santa based log for j cartooning. Very small uh, window of uh, of interest. But 
this is here it is, folks. This is uh, Santa Claus who actually doesn't understand that he uh, he he doesn't need to give a log for Jay. Get it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, he's asking, "Is Jay's been a good little boy?" And everybody realizes nobody wants this <laughs> present from Santa. That log is about to explode. In it's space. about to explode. Yes. So this is the only DTNS is the only place on the internet where you can get a log for Jay. A holiday-themed um, Log for J <laughs> vulnerability poster. No one else is going to do this. You're no right. No one else. Right. Who else is going to do that? And <laughs> truly, that's that's truly that's, thought of for the first time today. That's right. That is part <laughs> of the reason why you need to support DTNS. And also, you know, if you're interested, you can you can support me at Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len. You can also get this at my online store at lenperaltestore.com, which, by the way, I'm still doing my uh, my uh, custom drawn holiday cards. I have another week of that. But more importantly, I just want to mention before, because this is going to be my last show of the year, unfortunately, Monday night on my Twitch channel, twitch.tv, uh, twitch.tv forward slash Len Peralta, uh, I'm doing a show called The Draw. It's a battle royale, an art battle, where I will be taking on none other than the the amazing Scott Johnson. It's I mean, me. this is a dream come true. <laughs> head to head. I, you are you are my two favorite artists, and and both of you are are my good friends. And <laughs> I uh, I always think about you as like, oh, there, there's Scott Art and there's Len Art, and they're both really good. I cannot wait to see you go head to head on this. This is gonna be well, so the fun. other funny thing about this is that the judges, one of the judges is Carter, his his daughter Carter Johnson. Two of the judges are my sons. Oh, so you stack the, the deck. That doesn't mean that I'm gonna <laughs> <Against> win. <yourself. laughs> It's actually you guys watching to decide. So check it out, twitch.tv forward slash Len Peralta. Thank you so much for such a great year, guys. Oh, Len. And, um, you, was, you've uh, made our year great as well. I'm looking forward to 2020, uh, 2022 with you guys. So thanks so much. Excellent. Uh, uh, someone else who made our 2021 not a total dumpster dive, Shannon Morse. Shannon, <laughs> uh, a bright light and a sea of gray. Uh, let folks know where Aww. they can keep up with your work. You know, that's why I color my hair, because I want to be a bright <laughs> light when I'm talking about hacks and malicious attacks. <laughs> uh, YouTube.com slash Shannon Morris is where you can check out all of my security and privacy videos for consumers and prosumers. As of late, I did a gifts for hackers video, and I absolutely love sharing ideas for the hacker, the maker, the 3D printer, uh, the DIYer in your life. So definitely check out that video. And I will be going to CES in January. I just confirmed that. So I hope to see you there. Woohoo. Uh, yeah. Some of us from DTNS will be there. You guys can all eat the great food and let us know how good it was. We're great live food. on. <laughs> it's free. That's why it's good. We're live on the show Monday through Friday. It's 4 30 p.m. Eastern. If you can join us, please do. By the way, that's 21 30 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're going to, you know, relax over the weekend, but we'll be back at it on Monday with Nicole Lee. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer, Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Associate producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scott S1, Biocap. Captain Kipper, Jack Shid, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, Creative Ast Arts, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Trace Gaynor. Patreon support from Stefan Brown. Contributors for this week's show included Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Shannon Morse. Guests on this week's show were Brian Brushwood and Ayaz Akhtar. And thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. information about this and other shows, visit frogpants.com. Audio program so good, it's like you're there. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>